And so that's another thing is like trying to take note of when I feel good so that when I feel bad, I can, I can say to myself, and I do literally out loud whisper to myself, you do not feel like this all of the time, Marsha. You do not feel like, you did not feel like this at four o'clock yesterday. And then having that letter written is a little bit more of evidence. You didn't feel like this at four o'clock yesterday. And look, you even wrote to your future self to tell her. Mm. <laughs> Hello, hello, hello! Welcome back to the Feel Good Factor. I'm Susmita Viganosaurus, and I'm so glad you could join me here today. Hey, everyone! I have a very special guest here today. Her name is Marsha Shander. So I discovered Marsha. maybe just a few weeks ago when i was listening to her being interviewed on somebody else's podcast and the moment i was listening to her i'm like oh my god i need to get to know her and i need to have her and her awesome energy on my show it is great i was actually able to make a meeting with her talk to her get to know her and then i've been reading a lot of information on her website and really enjoying it Masha is a very positive person and she is a master of storytelling. I want you all to get to know her story and uh, yeah, I I know you're all going to just really really enjoy this episode. So, here we go. Hey Masha. Hi. I love that you call me a positive person because I think of you as such a positive just joyful delight. Aww. And so <laughs> I'm like real recognizing real. That's great. I do have the word yes <laughs> tattooed on my finger. So I think that There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes to positivity. Yeah. First of all, I was very curious to know. So your website uh, and your whole brand is called Yes Yes Marsha. So why is it Yes Yes Marsha? Well, it's <laughs> because of that positivity i did an exercise um when i did a a course years ago 7 years ago i did a course marie folio's course b school um which is mm. kind of about how to help you start up an online business and one of the exercises she made us do at the beginning which is a thing i think everybody on the planet should do is we had to email 25 people we know like people we know well people we don't know well and ask them what are my three best qualities and you can give them a, a survey so they can do it anonymously and you know i i was hoping like it would be like she's funny she's beautiful <laughs> you know that wasn't what came up <laughs> number number 1 was kindness which is very nice and number 2 was positivity and when it mm-hmm. came to um getting a website my last name is you know it's hard to pronounce it's hard to spell and so i had a website that was my first and last name but i didn't want to have something so complicated and honestly i went for hello marsha but it was taken by somebody else i went for i i typed in hi marsha but when it's all one word and bear in mind i'm english it looks like it's saying him ars ha and so i didn't want people to be like who's who's ours <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and um and so i i looked at those traits and i thought well i can't be like kind marsha that's a bit of a weird thing especially as a british person who lives in canada you know it's very very embarrassing to talk about yourself like that and so positivity was number 2 so and i was going to put yes marsha but somebody else had it on twitter already And so I thought what if I just say yes yes Marsha and honestly at the time I was like oh this is so silly I'm going to have to change it and then it's just served me so well <laughs> because it's kind yeah. of silly and a bit strange and people remember it and you know now when I go to conferences people go yes yes Marsha like that's a thing that they <laughs> say and and I and I do have this tattoo now that says yes on my finger which is sort of separate from that Anyway, and so it so it served me really well. I have a little hand symbol I do at the beginning of my videos. I stole it from the village people because they do hand symbols in YMCA. So I took the Y and the M from YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's really great. And actually when I first did it, I was meeting with a friend of mine and he gave me a funny look and he said, "Um, it sounds a bit like somebody's you know, having a sexy time with you." And I said, "But but I said, but if they are, that it's clearly going very well. <laughs> Suggest I'm very good at fixing time, so I'm okay with that. 
it really suits you because like you said it brings out that personality of yes positivity yes but also the, like you said silliness funniness you have like this great sense of humor making people laugh and it's a lot of fun to say yes yes masha yes, you know it's, fun, isn't it? <laughs> it, it's harder to i i think people won't remember your uh, last name so mm-hmm. much they'll be like oh yes yes masha right mm-hmm. <laughs> they would mm-hmm. probably never yeah. say your masha shander they'll be like who is that <laughs> well, even when i worked in radio in the uk i didn't use my last name because it was such a strange word and it's not quite spelled exactly how it sounds and and um and actually in the uk there's so few people called marsha it's not a very popular name there that i just was mm-hmm. marsha so my my name on the radio was just marsha <laughs> like Prince or Madonna I just had one one name I loved it and it was kind of I feel like it's also nice that it gives me a little bit of anonymity you know as well yeah. there's a kind of mm-hmm. separation and I think just you know sometimes from from overly keen fans certainly when I was on the radio but also just even in terms of you know activism that I that I am somewhat try and be an activist and have lots of friends who are and I know that in data protection, the, the, the data protection laws and anti-terrorism laws mean that it can be kind of dangerous to, <laughs> to be an activist. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the ways certainly that our governments here in Canada and in the US and in the UK, that they could just arrest you and never tell you why. And so mm-hmm. having, again, a level of anonymity, I think, is not a bad thing. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, look at me, even me, I'm not really known for my last name. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I'm known as Veganosaurus, right? right. So <laughs> it's, it's fun and uh, yeah, a little bit of that additional mm-hmm. anonymity. Mm-hmm. Where does your name come from? Because you were saying it's um, the UK, it's a rare name. Mm. So where does your name come so from? So I'm Russian. My dad mm-hmm. lived his whole life in Russia. My mom grew up in England, but her mum, my granny, actually lived in Russia till she was five and then she had to flee the Bolsheviks and moved to Turkey and then eventually back to the UK, which is where my mum grew up. And um, and so I lived in Russia when I was very little, just until I was two. But my name comes from my dad. It's actually a Hungarian name. It means Alexander. But what's nice about it is I am what's known as a Google whack, where I don't think there's another Marsha Shandor in the whole world. If you if you Google uh-huh. Marsha Shandor, I'm the only thing that comes up. Although there is a place in India called the Shandor Pass, where oh, okay. um, <laughs> apparently it's very beautiful. Uh, I've never been, I would love to go. But yeah, it's not a very, it's not a very common name. And, uh, and I kind of, I kind of like that. I kind of liked having a bit of a special name and Marsha, I think Marsha in North America is much more common. Everybody knows there's a TV show called the Brady Bunch and, and one of the characters would say, all I ever hear is Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And so everywhere I go (laughs) in Canada and the U S people say that to me, but in the UK, it's not really a very well-known name. And, uh, and so I quite like, yeah, I quite like, you know, I'm a bit like being a bit special and different. <laughs> so it's nice having a name that makes me feel a bit special and different. You mentioned your grandmother and I think I'm in love with her. And I love how you, you know, whenever you sing songs that she sang to you and I love that voice you do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's just so nice to get to know about her or, you know, or, or rather like your experience with her and it's so lovely so you know the impressions are so coming back to that you just did the Brady Bunch thing mm. and then I'm talking about your, you know grandmother and all that so were you always good at impressions were you always good at like slightly switching your voice <laughs> it's, funny, and... it's funny because I don't think of myself as being good at impressions I'm really bad at accents even I've been in Canada for 10 years and I cannot do a good <laughs> Canadian accent I can do you know that there's certain accents I can do that if I do them here people are impressed if I do a Scottish accent in front of Canadians they're like wow that's really good but if I do it in front of anybody from the UK they're like what is is there something wrong with your mouth like what's happening and I think with my granny you know I grew up with my granny who had this accent that was kind of Russian Turkish because she moved to Turkey when she was a little girl but then she went to a Russian school and her family was still you know the other and the other refugees that she was with were all Russian and so she had this thick thick accent it's not like Russian is sort of a bit more 
Yes. Whereas my granny was like, yes, Marsha, come here. And then, <laughs> and then I grew up with my uncle Boris, who was from her first marriage, who grew up in Turkey, also had this thick accent. Boris, much more clipped like this. And so I think I can do the accents of my family that were around mm-hmm. me. Um, but I'm not, that, I'm not that good at other ones. <laughs> but it's funny, you mentioning that, like what you say that's so nice about getting to know my granny is that telling a story about my granny was my route into storytelling because Ooh. I had got really obsessed with, so storytelling is, is the thing that I teach the most. And I had got really obsessed with a podcast um, out of the U S called the moth, which is, it's a live storytelling show and they turned it into a podcast and I would listen to it all the time. And then I, I was living in the UK at the time and I thought there has to be something like this in London. You know, there's everything in London. And so I looked up and sure enough, I found a show called True Stories Told Live and I went along a few times and then I pitched to tell a story and I pitched to tell this story about my granny, which I think is the story you've heard. It's on, it's on, um, uh, oh no, I put some in the, in the blogs that you mentioned, but, but there's also a story on YouTube of my granny. And, and what was so amazing was when I told this story, I felt like I got to see her again. She died about three years before and she, we were very close. She brought me up and, Mm -hmm. and it felt like I got to spend time with her and it was so wonderful. And, and, and whenever I've told that story to a, to a captive audience since it feels that way, it feels like I get to see her. And I've since learned what's happening in the brain when you're telling a story is that your brain actually thinks the story's happening to you. They've done studies where they look at people's brains and your brain lights up as if you are experiencing the story. And it's the same for anybody listening. So if you feel like you've got a sense of knowing my granny, it's, it's because your brain was acting as if you were with her. And so that's so wonderful for me, you know, for, for and I've told stories since of other people that I've lost. My uncle Boris died a, a few years ago and I once told a story about him. And honestly, I told it because I was like, I want to see him again. <laughs> I want to feel like I get to spend time with him again. So it's quite a, it's quite a profound thing. I think about, about storytelling that you get to, it's like time travel. And sometimes time travel involves seeing people that you don't otherwise get to see. You know how, when you dream about some, I don't know if you've ever lost somebody and then you dream about them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it feels like you get to see them or even just a friend you haven't seen for a while. It feels like you spent time with them. And so telling a story is kind of like dreaming when you're awake, but you get to choose what you're dreaming about. Yeah, that's so beautiful the way you put it and it's so, so true. I've never thought of it that way exactly as such, but you're right. Like when somebody passes away and then, you know, a few years later, like last evening I was sitting with my parents and uh, we were thinking of my granny and her sisters Mm -hmm. and, you know, all the guests who used to visit us when we were growing up and talking about them, their traits, going into those little details that really did bring them alive Mm -hmm. for us. But I do believe, yes, you know, you don't have to be very good at storytelling to be able to feel this connection that you're talking about. But if you are as talented as you are, and if you are so good, then I do believe it becomes even more stronger. So how how can people do that? How can they get better at telling stories? Because I do know you have a method that you have studied and, Mm -hmm. you know, you've broken down your own experience into a method and then you Mm -hmm. teach that so uh, what what do you share with people about that? So the the first thing to say is that um, often people think that the most important thing in a story is the narrative, is what happened, and actually uh, that's not true. You know, because we've all had an experience of uh, we all have that one person in our life who they can tell any story, and it's fascinating, and and we all have had an experience of sitting next to somebody who we know did something interesting, but oh my gosh, when are they going to stop talking because they're so boring and, and want to fall asleep? Mm-hmm. And what what happens is they're just not, the second person is not following the rules of storytelling, that I think there's a big myth that, that you're born a good storyteller or you're not, and that's it. And it's just not true. It's absolutely a set of rules that anyone can follow. And the most important one of those rules is that when you're telling a story, you're making a movie inside your listener's brain. So if you think about movies, there are three different kinds of scenes. You have voiceover scenes. So voiceover is disembodied voice from the future giving context or philosophy. So if you think about uh, the example I often give is the one at the beginning of the Shawshank Redemption, where you have Morgan Freeman saying, there must be a con like me in every prison in America. And, And so he's kind of telling you the context and telling you the philosophy and telling you some things, you know, that that have happened already. 
So that's voiceover. And then you have montage and montage is lots of scenes done in real time, but cut together with music. Mm -hmm. And they use them to show something changing or, or just passage of time. So, you know, like the Rocky training montage or in a romantic movie, the montage of getting to know each other or in any movie where somebody has to learn a, a dance. You know, we, we, we have a montage of learning the dance steps. And they do that so that we don't have to watch 15 hours of footage of them learning dance steps or 15 hours of footage of them going on a date and, you know, paying for the tickets <laughs> at the movie theater and then going in and getting a seat and going to get popcorn, you know, so that, so that it saves us a lot of time in the movie. And then there's action scenes and action scene is everything is happening in real time, sometimes slow-mo, but usually real time, all from the perspective of one or a couple of the characters. So if you think about movies, most movies are mostly made up of action scenes. And I don't even mean like there's a car chase or there's a fight. I just mean like a scene that everything is happening in real time. And, mm. and you know, if you had a whole movie that was voiceover, that would be a boring movie. If you had a whole movie that was montage, that wouldn't be, you wouldn't be engaged. And so it's the same when it comes to telling stories. And the difference between those three kind of scenes and stories is to do with granular sensory detail and emotion. So voiceover in storytelling context and philosophy might be saying, um, when I was 19, I went traveling around Europe. I visited nine different countries. I felt it was important to meet people from different cultures and expand my horizons. So you have a sense of what I did. You know my opinion on what I did, but you don't actually know what that trip was like. Montage mm -hmm. is little flash bulbs of pictures. So when I was 19, I went traveling around Europe. We drank red wine in Paris. We walked the streets of Berlin, we looked at the canals in Amsterdam. So again, you know more about what I did, but you don't know what that trip is like. But then action scene is getting super granular and saying, I'm standing on the subway in Paris when this woman gets up and starts walking towards me and I panic because I don't speak French. And then she says in perfect English, I'm terribly sorry, you seem to have dropped your 200 franc note. And that's yeah. action scene. And that's where all the magic happens. That's where our brains think the story is happening to us and you as the listener feel like it's happening to you. And the way that you write an action scene is you just keep answering the questions. What did it look like or feel or smell or sound like? And how did you feel? And you make sure you have that emotion in it because that's how we can relate to anything. You know, you, you were just talking about your granny. I'm guessing your granny probably wasn't a Russian lady who lived, you know, half her life in Turkey and half her life in England. But you know how it feels to, to, to sit with your granny and hold her wrinkly hand as she's singing. And so you can connect with that story um, through the sensory details and through the emotions, because we've all experienced most sensory details and we've all experienced most emotions. And so that's how you can relate to any story. And it's also what the emotions are what makes us care. Because if you say, I sat down next to my granny, we might be like, okay, but if you say I sat down next to my granny and I was terrified, then we're like, ooh. <laughs> or I sat down next to my granny and I was so happy. Then we're like, ah. Oh. And it and it connects us to the story and it makes us interested and and it creates, you know, sometimes it creates tension, like in the example of saying, and I was terrified, because then we want to know why. You know, why were you terrified? As humans, we're very curious. So that's the main thing is tell action scenes. And if you need to tell a story that spans any length of time, you just choose a few action scenes and then you can use voiceover or montage to jump between them. Um, but because obviously you can't tell the whole story in action scene because nobody has five years to listen to your story. And a lot of that story would be boring. You know, you're buying the popcorn, mm -hmm. and you're getting to find your seat. You don't need to describe every bit of that in detail. Um, but really those action scenes are where all of the magic happens. So what did it look like or smell or sound or taste like? And how did you feel? Wow, you are right. But I've so I've been reading up on your blog posts about the stories, and I tried this. I've been applying that when I've been writing too. In the sense of, I do have a tendency to do voiceover and action uh, scenes, but then I try to give more um, weightage to action scenes. Great. Ever since I've got to know oh, about great. you, <laughs> and you know, especially reading all your posts, right? I'm like, yes, action scene. Is this action? No. How did I feel? What did this feel like? And I can see people responding in a certain way. Oh, you know, and they're interested. But how do you, you know, the, the granular details, that's what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to pick and what to leave out? So you always want to ask yourself a question at the beginning. And the question is, what am I trying to get across with this story? And sometimes mm -hmm. that's a message. You know, sometimes that's 
um, customers can surprise you or mindfulness is important or whatever it is. And sometimes that's a bit of narrative. Sometimes it's when I go shopping with my mum, she spends a lot of money. And so then you then whenever you're editing and and there's a I have a big hero, this lady, Marion Roach Smith, um, who uh, wrote a book called The Memoir Project. And she talks about what she calls the vomit draft, where she says your first draft has to just be everything. And, and I've since learned that the different parts of our brain, the, the parts of our brain we use to write and the parts of our brain we use to edit are completely different parts of our brain. So we cannot edit as Ooh. we're writing. And so it's really important that the first draft is just everything, you know, in the kitchen sink. And then when you go back to edit, if you've asked yourself, what am I trying to get across? Then you can ask yourself at every point, do I need, need, need this to get across what I'm trying to get across? And sometimes that's going to be bits of narrative. You know, say you're telling a story about how your mum spends a lot of money when you go shopping with her and you are going, you're telling the story about going out to the shops and then halfway through this woman comes walking down the street dressed as a giant rabbit and starts break dancing. <laughs> and it was amazing and there's a big crowd and everyone's clapping and then you keep going. You have to ask yourself, do I need that part to get across that my mom spends a lot of money? No, I don't. So you so you cut it and trust that you'll use it somewhere else. Maybe somewhere else you're telling a story about how, mm. you know, don't expect that your day will be normal because you never know when a giant rabbit's going to come along. And you can use <laughs> that there. And then I think also with details, you know, sometimes you, some it is important to have some, you don't want to say, I walked into a room, there was a person there, we said some things, you know, you need to have some details. But in terms of the sensory details, you don't, nobody, some people say, oh, I don't like to edit my stories, but everybody edits our stories. Otherwise, every single story we tell would go, I opened the door, I stepped through the door, I stepped into the room, I looked down, there were um, you know, wooden slats on the floor. There was 75 slats and they were joined with black, you know, that would, it would be bananas and it would go on for four years. You would never get through any story. And so it's just asking yourself, what do I need to get across? I often say to people, if they're saying they're sitting in a room, describe how big the room is, because if it's a tiny closet or if it's a giant warehouse, that makes a difference to us. And so, you know, if you say I'm in the kitchen, I'm in the bedroom, we can have a pretty good sense. But if you say mm. I'm at work, like, are you in a cubicle? Are you in your own office? Are you standing in a factory? Are you working behind the bar? Like, give us just a little bit of something. If you're working mm. in a bar, what kind of bar is it? Like, is it sleek metal or is it old fashioned wood? Just give us a little bit of something so we have a good sense, but you don't need to describe every single shelf and every single glass. Mm, that that makes so much sense. And what I like best about everything you said is that uh, you can actually save the parts because I mean, mm -hmm. that rabbit down the street is gold and yeah. I don't want to throw that out, yeah. but use it somewhere else, right? Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. And so have somewhere that you keep. So everybody, if they want to tell stories, have somewhere where you keep ideas and everything you see, write it down. And then when you need a story, you can look through and be like, oh, I could write about that or I could write about this. So, yeah, always have a place to keep them. Same with ideas. Otherwise, they just bounce around your head trying to get noticed. So have a place where you write them down. Oh, yeah, that really helps. <laughs> I do that with ideas now. I've learned the hard way <laughs> that yeah. I better do that. Otherwise, either I forget them or I try to do everything at once and then just doesn't work, right? right. Like you just do one thing at a time. Yes, so. yes. <laughs> So I'm, I'm curious, so do you do, because, you know, everything that you're talking about, about the stories and the details, that, you know, the feelings and all of that, this is a technique all of us use in visualization and manifestation mm -hmm. too. So is that something you practice? It's, um, I mean, I've been a furious daydreamer since I was very young. <laughs> and, I, and I have sometimes, you know, I'm sort of in the self-development world. So I've definitely run into it and done classes and courses where we do. I don't, I don't know that it's something I especially do, although I feel like there is a certain... So I'm somebody who like has one foot in woo and one foot in, you know, science and logic. And so... <laughs> But I really, the more I do woo-woo things, the more I realize there's almost always a practical element to it. So if you were to sit and visualize, mm -hmm. 
maybe you're calling it in through manifestation or maybe just when that opportunity shows up you're more likely to orient yourself towards it you know you're more likely to notice potential opportunities because you've already been thinking to yourself this is a thing I want to do Mm. and so you know even in 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 the same way I feel like I just had a tarot reading and I was saying it's a friend of mine that does it and I was saying she's called Katie Braha and I was saying to her (laughs) um even if you know, sometimes it's just a way to help me look at things differently. Like maybe there was a time I was going through something very difficult and then I looked at my tarot reading for the year and and it had said, this is a period where you're going to be really learning about things. And even if that was just nonsense that, you know, she just made up, it made me able to look at what I was going through as a learning experience instead of just this terrible, horrible, awful thing that I was going through. Mm-hmm. And so it helped mm-hmm. me have a different angle. So I think in the same way with manifestation, I feel like, I I think even at the it's it's even if doing it is just an exercise in knowing what you want because it's much easier to get what you want when you're clear on it rather than I just would like some nice things to happen that you're much more likely to look for those opportunities or work for them or notice them when they show up. Yeah, that that's a that's an interesting way of looking at it. But it yes, it makes sense and comes down to this thing of practice it and you know. No matter in which way, but yes, it's going to work for your benefit and it's always good to daydream. Yeah, exactly. And it's fun. And it's fun. It's so much fun. <laughs> you know, I, I was uh, looking at your uh, world domination uh, summit thing. Mm. <laughs> so you were t- you were sharing the story of how you had envisioned it would be, right? Mm. So, um, yes. and then <laughs> that, that whole thing, though it wasn't exactly the way you thought it would be, the fact that you dreamt of it so much and wanted to be a part of it so much that you picturized it so clearly. I do believe that is what, you know, finally, uh, either if, if I'm talking on manifestation terms and open the opportunity for you, or if you're talking in terms the way you are saying that, you know, you were so receptive yeah. to it when well, it did open up. It's not just that I was receptive to it, but I asked. So I went, mm-hmm. so, so the story is that this conference, World Domination Summit, I started going in 2013 and every year I would sit in the audience audience and think oh oh, you know if I was doing a keynote what would mine be about um (laughs) can I tell you a story this is an awful story to admit but I think it's it's kind of funny but a few years before I did my talk it was it was the third day of the conference and it had been a very emotional conference for me and a very emotional day I'd made friends with this um, lady Samantha Nolan Smith who was incredible and she and I had just had this big you know deep talk sitting in the park crying and and I was sat in the final session and there was a speaker who I just didn't quite connect with you know we don't connect with every single speaker and and so instead I thought what would my talk be about and so I started imagining my talk and 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 I imagined this part of it, and it was the only part that actually stayed in the final talk. It's the last couple of minutes. But in the, in the moment, I was so moved by my own imaginary talk that I started crying. Oh, <laughs> I if this speaker looks down, she's going to be like, wow, I really moved that girl. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, I, but, I, but so I daydreamed and daydreamed. And then with WDS, I first did a workshop. So I got asked to come and help them coach the storytellers because they have attendee storytellers. And then mm-hmm. um, I really wanted to do a workshop. And I, you know, like most people thought, well, they will come to me and say, oh, Marsha, we'd love you to do a workshop. And of course, that most of the time doesn't happen. And so very awkwardly, sitting in a small windowless office with Jolie. <laughs> Gillibo, who's one of the organizers, I sat and went, um, Jolie, I'd, um, I'd really, um, I'd really like to teach sometime if, if you think that that would be okay. Like it was not bold. And she went, oh yeah, let's get you doing a workshop next year. And I was like, oh, that was easy. So I did a workshop that went really well. It was the first to sell out. And then I did another one the following year that again went really well. And then I got an email from the organizer, Chris, from the, the sort of the head organizer, Chris Gillibo, um, and he said, what would you like to do next year? And I said, I would love to do a keynote. And and I think I felt bold enough to ask it because I had been imagining it. So <laughs> I'd already cried. <laughs> I'd already made at least one person cry, me. <laughs> and so, and if I hadn't, you know, I maybe wouldn't have been audacious enough to ask because I wouldn't have been thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And, um, and that doesn't always happen, like, 
you know, when people think about things, there are two ways they think about it, right? Like people can think about it and then think about how it can go wrong and panic. And even that is daydreaming, even that is imagination. You mm. know, people can use their imagination. But when you use it the way you did, like what could go right? What could go better? Oh my God, this is getting better. And but, you know, that is visualization right there, right? So that positive way of looking at it and thinking it. And it's so beautiful, the journey where, things opened up then you took the step then again something opened up and then you took the further step like the, the way it worked right. is so beautiful to hear and I should add that I do the other thing too I mean that whole talk is about what I call your beast which is the little creature that sits in your mm -hmm. ear when you're when you're about to pitch the talk and says no one's going to give you a talk no one wants to hear what you have to say and I also imagined all the ways that it would go horribly wrong which for me mostly mm -hmm. was about I wouldn't do enough preparation and I'd forget what I was saying and I'd regret not having done more work on it. And I was, to my shame, two hours before the talk, I was in my hotel room rewriting parts of the talk. <laughs> and I was about to do like the, I mean, that was in many ways, that was the biggest talk of my career per, on a personal level, because even though I've done talks to bigger audiences, that was one that, you know, I first went to WDS what, in 2013, I just started my business and, and so I had sort of grown up in that conference. And so it was so, so important to me to do it. And I was the closing keynote on the penultimate year ever of the conference. And, wow. and, um, and so I do daydream the other things. But another thing on that, I've learned a really important lesson from my mum a few years ago. So when I worked in radio, I worked at a station called XFM. I was a radio DJ. And it was a, a, a sort of smallish indie station, but it was owned by the same company that owned the biggest pop station in the whole of London, one of the biggest radio stations in the whole country. Certainly, I think outside of the national stations, it was the biggest. And there was the breakfast show that was hosted by this very famous guy called Johnny Vaughan, who was like on TV all the time. And, and this was the, the radio station that I had grown up. It's called Capital Radio. I'd grown up listening to it. I could sing you every single Capital Radio jingle from the 90s. I somehow ended up by a series of sort of accidental conversations auditioning to be the co-host on this show. And I knew that the previous co-host had been paid £100,000 a year. <laughs> this is, you know, bear in mind, this is 15 years ago. So uh, if you were just for inflation, that's a lot of money. And I, and I went for the job and then I was waiting to find out. And my mum said to me, oh, I love when they say you might have the job because then you can really daydream and enjoy it. And then even if you don't get the job, you had a lovely time in the run up. <laughs> and the thing was, my usual instinct was, oh, don't dream about it because then I'll just get my hopes up and then I'll be disappointed. And that's mm -hmm. what I always used to do. And when my mom said that to me, I thought, you know what? Every single time I've gone for something and I didn't allow myself to daydream, I was still really disappointed. <laughs> like it didn't, it didn't protect me from be, being disappointed. And so mm. I did that. I really daydreamed. I spent that hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> I met all the celebrities because, you know, all the most famous celebrities would come on that show. And I, you know, and I was sort of stepping out in London and getting up at three in the morning and being part of that team. And then I didn't get the job, but I did have a really good time. And so I've kind of done that ever since that, you know, there was a point where somebody from Penguin Random House approached me um, and asked if I would pitch a book. And I, oh my gosh, just need to, I was in my brain, I was hanging out with Oprah. I was being interviewed by Brene Brown. I was like, somebody told me Oprah has a cruise. I was a guest on Oprah's cruise, you know, and I had such a good time. And then eventually they said no to that book. Like there's still something I'm, I'm, I'm talking about pitching them a different book. But anyway, they said, but it, I, it was fine because I'd already had so much of the good time in my brain. And so that's another benefit of daydreaming is that you get, you know, and as we know from storytelling and as you probably know from visualization, the brain responds as if it's already happening. So mm. it feels really good. And, and with that, what, there was one point with, gosh, with, there was one conversation I had with a book where somebody was saying, you know, we, we want to get a six figure, six figure contract. So hundred thousand dollars US, <laughs> which is much more than Canadian dollars. And, and between, between that first conversation and when they said no, I was telling everyone about it. And one friend said, but aren't you worried that 
you know, if it doesn't happen, it'll then be embarrassing that you've told all these people. And I'd said, it's such an unlikely thing to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody's going to be like, oh, wow, you didn't just earn $100,000 out of nowhere, you loser. <laughs> People are just like, yeah, that super unlikely thing to happen didn't happen. That seems pretty normal. <laughs> and so that's what I think. I think when there's a maybe, you know, keep always keep in your heart that it might not happen. Always keep that possibility in, in you know, expect the worst, hope for the best is what people say. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um, but like daydream and enjoy it because really anything you know it's it's so much fun and then you can have a really good time and then if it didn't happen as my mom says if it doesn't happen you at least you had a really good time in your head <laughs> gosh I love that I absolutely love that because like you said a lot of the time people are afraid to have hope or to express that or to dream you know to dream like the way you do you're like oh no I'm gonna jinx it or mm. or I'm gonna be disappointed mm. and you know the, these these thoughts that people do have but I absolutely agree with your mom I like I'm so in alignment with this this whole teaching of just dream and just enjoy it and just visualize it See, the thing about when we even say, when we speak about visualization and all these things, it's it's this, you you already act as if it has happened in your <laughs> mind, right? Or even in, in, in your case, even in reality, talking to people about it, you it's like you're beyond it. It's not picturing you, oh, congratulations, you got the job. No, it's mm -hmm. like spending the 100,000 meeting <laughs> opera, you know? The next steps after that, right? That is just, that the, that is the exact formula. And it's not, just the thinking or like being in it's not about being in denial and just saying it but it's mm. the feeling it's you know the power is in that right yeah I run a I do an exercise when I run workshops and actually on my um on my so I'm going to make a secret web page if you're listening I'm making you a secret web page which is just going to be yes yes marsha.com forward slash veganosaurus and on there I'll put the links to people I've been talking about like Marianne Roach Smith and Katie Baraha and I'll put a video about um uh, how to tell stories, but I, but I, um, on there as well, you'll see a thing to sign up to my mailing list. And, and with that, when you do, there's a, there's a link to an audio. So you can do a visualization about, and this is, I mean, it's probably very similar to things that you have, Smith, because it says visualization. And, and the idea of it is to get, is to connect with where you feel emotion in your body so that you can describe it for stories. Mm. Um, but the thing that I get people to do is think about a very exciting thing that's going to happen in the, that could happen in the next year. And whenever I do this exercise live, everybody's faces afterwards, people are high. <laughs> <laughs> get them to really imagine being in that place where the exciting thing has happened and what did it smell like and what did it physically feel like and how did you feel and where is it in your body and people come out of it like whoo smiling and and um and I did an exercise like that with somebody recently with a client and she came out of it and she said wow it just goes to show you that time really isn't linear is it <laughs> because in your brain you can jump around you know whether it's going back to see my granny whether it's going forward to spend that hundred thousand dollars that I just got um <laughs> and so it's really yeah I think it's I think it's a lovely thing and I think where it's dangerous is if you start to is if you is if you think that there's absolutely no way it's never not going to work and then it's sort of traumatic for you or it's grief for you but but in my mm. experience you are probably going to have some of that grief anyway not getting excited does not protect you from disappointment and grief when you don't get the thing and so why not get excited if it's not going to if it's not going to protect you why not just do it and have a good time yeah and it's not just that because you are feeling so good you're obviously happier you're more joyful your chances are you're going to do better you're mm. going to cope and you have like okay there, there is a point to life and then if things don't work out the way you imagined they would it doesn't matter because ultimately whatever made you feel those feelings something else will happen that will make you feel that way. Like what you were saying, like, you know, what whatever you were imagining or what you were dreaming about rather about uh, the, you know, the being the radio jockey, get you know, for being a co-host and that didn't work out, but you still got to enjoy the experience of, you know, hosting the radio show and and then also like doing what you love doing, you know. Right. I, I, I do believe 
it's very very apparent in all your videos your talks and uh, and by the way i have to say um to everybody so the the five part blog post series you have to put that in the secret okay. link the link to the series and i have to recommend this to everyone uh while you're reading the post listen to the audio also <laughs> <laughs> and there is magic in Marsha's <laughs> the way she speaks the way you know you are really there a lot more you know it's like double the dose of it than just reading it so definitely listen if you can it's very apparent that you love what you do and it brings you so much happiness and joy and uh, i do believe it's all you know it is also a, a you would say a benefit of the way you think about about daydreaming and visualizing and 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 just enjoying life that way so that is why i do believe your life is like this oh thank you thank you i'm really yes i feel like i'm very very lucky and i think yes i think a lot of it's because i'm happy and i also recognize that i have enormous amounts of privilege you know even just on a basic level that i'm mm-hmm. that i am as my friend rick says we're on the easiest easiest settings on the video game of life in that i'm I'm white, I'm cis, I'm non-disabled, I'm I'm queer, but people tend to read, straight people tend to assume that I'm straight. And so there's lots of barriers that I have absolutely not faced. And even, you know, I grew up in the country, I grew up, I lived a huge chunk of my life in the country that I had the citizenship of. And now I'm not in a country that I have citizenship of, but I but I speak the dominant language, you know, and I, and I, mm. and so I have all of those privileges and I feel like I and I just mentioned that because I think for a long time I was like yeah I'm successful because I'm happy and I'm positive and I work hard (laughs) and then I learned about like oh yeah and also it people are sort of pre and even like cheerfulness I think is a privilege because when I walk around the world unless I'm in southeast London or unless I'm in you know New York when I have to put my mean face on um, generally (laughs) I walk around the world just smiling and smiling at everyone and it's been safe for me to do that because I uh, don't look like a target to people and so and so that makes my life easier that when I walk into places I'm cheerful and, and it's very easy for me to be cheerful and so I do think that that's a privilege as well because I know some people for whom it's really hard to feel to to walk around being cheerful and having a cheery disposition and that's you know whatever the the combination of privilege and genes and and my mother who if you met her I think you would like even more than you like me (laughs) Um, (laughs) and so and I'm interested in things and I feel like even that's another you know that's kind of a lucky privilege because it means I I pretty much enjoy talking to anyone because I am interested in getting to know different kinds of people. And so, you know, and I'm curious about everything. I mean, when my mother comes to stay, it drives me up the wall. <laughs> everything she's asking at the other <laughs> one time, I think after like three days of her relentlessly asking questions, we were on the subway and she just saw a bunch of cars and she said, now, is that a car park or is that a car showroom? And I went, I don't know. I don't know everything about Toronto. <laughs> I apologize to her afterwards, my poor mother. Um, But it does make my, you know, it means it's really hard to bore me because I just will pick up a, you know, a a whatever. I'll pick up a Kleenex and be like, oh, how do they make these Kleenex? Oh, I see that there's like one or three different layers and there's perforations around the end. I wonder if that's a machine that makes that, you know. And so Curiosity. You take everything by curiosity. That is just such a beautiful way to live. Yeah. And again, it's, I feel like it's a beautiful way to live, but it's a lucky way to live because I know people who get bored easily and it's horrible for them. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. I know (laughs) you can cultivate curiosity, but when you naturally, same with curiosity and cheerfulness, when it comes very naturally to you, it's, I think, a much easier life in ways than for people who have to work hard at it. Uh, it's so true. No, I absolutely agree with you. And I, I feel lucky very often about my cheerfulness. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like, okay, people are always like, oh, you're a ray of sunshine and you're cheerful and all these things. And this is the first thing people do say about me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I do believe it's also a practice you have to cultivate yes. because, of course, we're human. It's very easy to go down this path of, oh, my God, everything's horrible. And what's yeah. the point of life? And blah, blah, blah. The beast, you know. Right. <laughs> so yeah. you go, go. it's easy to go down that path, but to be able to, um, or rather to be, to want it. Like, I, you know, I feel like very often people, uh, and I absolutely agree with you that, yes, not everybody is privileged enough to do it. But what I also see is, 
even if people are privileged, it's not that they are always thinking this way or being mm-hmm. positive or or wanting to be happy. Like this awareness that you have about your privilege that you spoke about, mm-hmm. it grounds you, but it does not pull you down right. under that level. But there are many people who are like, oh, there are so many people suffering. This is, you know, all this is happening in the world. And then they let themselves be brought down. And the one thing I believe is that um, if you are privileged, use that privilege, yes, to help others bring awareness and all that, but also use it to your advantage, for your feel goodness, to make yourself happy. Because only then when your cup is full and you're happy and you're cheerful, you can uplift others. Because if somebody is down and you're share, you know, putting this positive energy on them, no matter how difficult their life is, somewhere you're lighting some kind of spark, right? Some kind of joy you're bringing into their life. And I feel like, you know, if you're privileged, then try to go towards that you know towards your you know use that lean into that right right and i also have started to recognize that some people really enjoy being unhappy (laughs) i had a a relative that i had to buy a christmas present from and i was so stressed about it and i was talking to a friend and i was saying oh gosh i have to buy this present for this relative and i really love them but they're so judgmental about everything all of the time i just know i'm going to buy them something and they're going to be judgmental about it And she said, clearly this person loves being judgmental. The greatest Christmas gift you could give her is to give her something that she can then be judgmental about. (laughs) (laughs) I love that, yes. You know, the Mother's Day is a different date in in North America than it is in the UK. And, um, Mm -hmm. And I have some English friends here and I, and I once was, popped around in the evening sort of early evening like so uh, sorry early uh, yeah late afternoon early evening and I ran I saw one of them and I was like Dave 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 it's mother's day did you call your mom and he's like oh no I forgot so he brings his mom back in the UK and just oh you know here you are finally I've been waiting all day for a phone <laughs> and afterwards he said that was really the greatest gift I could have given her because I didn't forget but she got to be judgmental and cross with me about the fact that I <laughs> Oh my God. See, you know, this is unconditional love. You see what they like. And even, um, you know, this is something that I have been learning. There are no good or bad feelings or whatever. It's like for your better, you know, whatever path you are in your life. Fair enough. And there are people around us who will be this way. And I love that you can actually, you know, not only acknowledge it, not only get put off by it, but also say, Hmm, how can I support it? You know. <laughs> I mean, I say this now, but I think it's easy with people we don't know that well, and when it's people with people we know well, it becomes, oh, you're just out to get me, <laughs> and I hate this. <laughs> Why are we different? And why can't we think the same about everything? But it's constant. It's a work in progress, and I think you're right. You know, one of the big journeys for me in the last few years, and um, through, I am privileged enough to to be in therapy and to have been for a long time, but is learning that it's okay to have feelings because even though my family were Russian, I grew up mostly in the UK where it really isn't okay. You can be happy. That's the only feeling you're allowed. Maybe, maybe angry, but, um, but generally I kind of grew up being, with this messaging that it's, that, you know, don't have feelings. And I had so many of them. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. I was, you know, always like, what's, what's wrong with me? And, and just learning that, that like, oh, it's okay. I just, today is a sad day and I'm feeling really sad and that's okay. And I just have to accept that it's not going to be, you know, today's an angry day. I just have to accept that that's what's happening and not try and fight it. Because I find the only way out is through when I try and fight those feelings, they, they double down, you know, when I try and get the fat off me or get the anger off me. And, and the, the quickest way really to deal with them is to kind of you know, do it always feels like the emotional equivalent of sticking my hand in a flame, but just really lean into them and feel really sad or really mm-hmm. angry. And then often that's the route to release them. Like often that's the quickest route to, to being free of them as opposed to trying to avoid them because they just hang around. <laughs> oh, yeah. They hang around in different parts of your body, turn into different diseases, God knows, manifest in some other part of your life. Right. You know, uh, I absolutely agree. This, this, um, feeling them going through them you know that Mm -hmm. I do absolutely agree with you (laughs) it's not nice is it (laughs) it's not (laughs) it's nice after it's done right especially when you have that a good cry oh my god that feels amazing and you know it's like it again if it's in your nature to to be like think of it from a positive side Mm -hmm. or from curiosity or whatever even through the cry you're like 
oh god i'm going to feel so good after this you know that's going to be the <laughs> in your mind right like yo oh, but then it's like it's okay it's getting over it's getting okay. over you know that feeling <laughs> right 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 and i think that's often another way i mean what's interesting about the the exercise i mentioned earlier where we where i get people to go inside their bodies and and what do you feel and how would you describe that i always say describe what's happening in your body as if there were a doctor here and i was going to get them to create it in somebody else's body so rather than saying you know i feel happy and i'm excited it's saying i feel like my chest has a warm flame in the middle and i feel electricity in my fingertips and then mm. and actually it's kind of the core of buddhism is feel the feelings let go of the story and that's another thing that i've tried to do when i'm really overwhelmed by emotions and i am a very emotional person i think even yes yes marsha it's like i'm really happy you know <laughs> so i also get very sad and sometimes mm. when it feels overwhelming that's the thing is to be like just start getting curious about like okay where do i feel this in my body like a scientist just being like hmm my stomach is tight hmm my throat feels closed hmm it's kind of tingly in my fingers and and that's another way to get myself out of the you know often in my head it's either this is never going to work i'm never going to be able to or it's like and then you always and i never and how could you <laughs> That's the stuff that I find overwhelming. And so if I can get, if I can be like, oh, where in my body do I feel this fury? You know, where in my body do I feel this terrible despair about my life? It can kind of pull me out of that enough to be like, oh, okay, I'm just having a sad day. This isn't actually necessarily what's true. This is just mm. sad. Or, or even like I'm trying to make a note of when I feel happy about things. I have a, I have a um, file in my, so I, I use something called Evernote to collect mm ideas it's just a kind of note-taking app and I have a folder in there called future letters and when I'm in a really good mood which often for me is I'm only allowed one coffee a day because I have very low tolerance to caffeine so it's usually after I have my coffee I'm just high as a kite and I think everything's brilliant and and so I've learned to harness that and one of the things I do is I write my future self letters because often in those moments something that otherwise feels very tricky feels absolutely surmountable like absolutely something that I can deal with and so what I'll do is I'll say dear future Marsha I know you're worried about this 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 but actually you know, that, that, that. And so I think you're going to be fine. You're going to get through it. I believe in you, love past Marsha. And then when I'm having a bleak moment, I'll go into that folder. And sometimes it's just reminding myself I have been happy because I think when I'm sad, I'm like, this is everything in my life. I am always sad and I always have been sad and I always will be sad. And so to go and read those letters from my past self that explicitly say right now you are extremely happy feels really good. And I try and do it when something good has happened with work, because over time my brain starts going, ah, oh, it wasn't that good. But in the moment I'm like, this is amazing. So I try and write it down so that then mm. I can look back and be like, oh, maybe I'm not a complete loser because I did this, this, this. That's my number one thing my beast says to me is you're a loser, you're a loser. And so that's another thing is like trying to take note of when I feel good so that when I feel bad, I can, I can say to myself, and I do literally out loud whisper to myself, you do not feel like this all of the time, Marsha. You do not feel like, you did not feel like this at four o'clock yesterday. And then having that letter written is a little bit more of evidence. You didn't feel like this at four o'clock yesterday. And look, you even wrote to your future self <laughs> to tell her. Mm. <laughs> I love that. That is so awesome. And I'm definitely, I mean, I am so with you on getting excited with coffee because like if you're already a naturally excitable mm -hmm. person, you know, I, then when coffee, I, I don't even have coffee every day. I, I, I save it and then like you say, harness it, you know, yes. but just writing the letters, I love that. And I often tell people like when I have my down times and I can get terribly sad or dark and all these things too, right? The other extra, like it's, it's like, you know, the feelings, it's like a ping pong ball or whatever, like it's right. going to one end and banging with the same force, it'll bang in the other end too. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that you're not putting it out onto the world so easily. So I, I, I always tell people that yeah uh, all I do is just take a break step away from everything and then just sit there and remind myself that this is going to pass because remember you felt happy but I like your practical tip of writing your future self a letter so that then you have something to go and look back to you know that is so cool I'm totally trying that next time <laughs> also your friends might say to you it's not that bad and you'll think you don't get it but if you're saying it to yourself you do get it <laughs> 
<laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah, <laughs> so, so true. I feel like it's got much more credibility. The other thing I do is when I wrap up my Christmas decorations every year, I write, I write the person who's unwrapping the Christmas decorations a note. So January Marsha, who's wrapping up the, and it started because I had to, I was wrapping up my Christmas lights one year and I needed to wrap them around a piece of card. And then I needed to tell my future self which end to unwrap from, because you know, lights can get so tangled. And so I just wrote this end, start this end, please, Marshy. I call myself Marshy. That's my like nice name for each. <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm tough love, I call myself Shandor. <laughs> but when I'm being kind, I call myself Marshy. And so I said, Un- unwrap this end, please, Marshy. And then I thought, well, that's kind of boring. So I said, hope you've had a great year. And then they've just evolved. And now it's not even about the Christmas lights anymore. I just write myself all these notes. And so, and sometimes it's kind of silly, like, oh, that thing that happened in February. And what about in the summer? That was amazing, wasn't it? By the way, your dress looks great because I usually wear a dress. So it's a good <laughs> bet if I say, your dress is looking really great today. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and then when I've gone through hard times, I've actually written quite emotional let it you can kind of tell the state of my mind in January by by what the note is like and sometimes it will be you know I hope whatever whatever you've gone through this year you're doing okay and I really believe in you and it's going to be okay and and I had one one year that just said because I love Christmas so much that just said dear December dear November December whatever the year was Marshy don't forget whatever else is happening this is your season and I like stuck it up on the wall (laughs) So like, it is my season and so that's another thing I recommend is like hiding hiding future notes for yourself or even I remember one year I was doing my taxes and I was going through the receipts and I was doing years worth because I'm always behind and I was getting closer and closer to the bottom of 2014 and there was nothing for 2015 and I was starting to panic and then I got right to the bottom and there was a note that said dear future Marsha your 2015 taxes are in a plastic bag in this cupboard in this place Marcia. <laughs> oh, this is so awesome. Oh my God. This is so fun. What a fun life you must have with these, you know. Oh my God. Do you do this for others too? Like, you know, uh, like your partner, your family members, whoever in your life? You know, I don't. The closest I've come is I have one of my best, best, best friends from school. Uh, she lives in the UK now, but we often have these long email exchanges. And we had one that was so fun. We were both having a bad day. And we were writing to each other. And then somehow it just evolved into us sharing really funny memories from when we were in our teens and when we were in our 20s. And it was so lovely that what I did is I, I use an email scheduler called Boomerang for Gmail. And mm. I am, um, which they you can use it for Outlook and all the other ones too. Uh, I'll link to it in the secret web page. But I, what I did was I scheduled the email for six months into the future to both of us so that six months into the future, we'd be reminded of this brilliant exchange. Because, you know, with emails, they're not like letters. You don't come across them unless you're like especially searching for something. And so sometimes I do that if I've had really nice emails, then I'll schedule them. Or sometimes I need to remind myself of something in the future, like... You know, if you cancel a if you if you cancel a flight and you've got the um, re, which of course most of us did who were traveling a lot last year, <laughs> and you have to rebook it by a certain time, I'll often schedule an email for the time when I have to rebook it to say, dear future Marshy, this is you know don't forget to rebook the flights. But then I'll write something. Sometimes I'll say like this is what's happening now, or like I hope you're doing well, or whatever. And so that's always a nice surprise because I forget that that's going to happen. Or sometimes, you know, I have to email, I promise someone, oh, I'll email you again in two months time. And so I write myself the email immediately then and then schedule it. And then when it comes to that time, the note comes up on my calendar. I'm like, oh gosh, I have to compose this email. What am I going to say? And then past Marsha is like, it's okay. I've done it for you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks past Marsha. You know, past Marsha really helps me. Sometimes she really doesn't help me. Sometimes it's two days before the workshop is due and past Marsha did not spend five weeks writing it past Marsha went on Netflix and was on Facebook too much so then I cursed past Marsha <laughs> oh my god I I just love this and you know I can uh, I could just listen to you and listen to all your stories and your insights and all these fun ideas and tricks that you have forever like this is this is so great 
you know, it's been so good chatting with you and I'm I'm so, so happy and grateful that you, you were able to make the time to be here, to share all these things and, you know, just, just I, I can't wait for people to check out your secret link and then, you know, go secret web page and then go and just really dive into the world of Yes, Yes, Marsha, because it's, it's going to turn their lives um, absolutely around. <laughs> well, my face hurts from smiling so much, which is always a good Aww. sign at the end. <laughs> Thank you. And I'd love them to. So I have that secret web page, which is Yes, Yes, Marsha, M-A-R-S-H-A. So yes, yes, Marsha.com forward slash Veganosaurus, or I'm just at Yes, Yes, Marsha everywhere on social media. Um, and so if, if anybody, if you message me, I'd totally love to hear from you. Ping me and I'll ping you back. Sure. And, you know, I saw your, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm subscribed to your newsletter, of course. And uh, I saw that you are not on Clubhouse yet. But if you ever get on to Clubhouse, please let me know. Okay. I would so love to host a room with you. <laughs> like, you would make such a fun <laughs> person to host a room with. Thank you. I wrote a whole blog post about how I want to be on Clubhouse so badly, but I'm not. And it's and this, and this is a thing that future Marsha, like current Marsha is very pleased to pass Marsha because I've had a lot of deadlines recently. And past Marsha wanted to go on Clubhouse so badly, but she resisted. So this is a time when I say thank you, past Marsha. Because even though it would have been so fun, I just... I would have had such a much harder time with my deadlines. But yeah, I love the idea of it. So I'm sure I'll be on there at some point. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to catching up with you there too. And of course, going back down the rabbit hole, you know, I have to tell everybody this. So when I found, uh, when, I, when I listened to Marsha's interview on the other podcast, which is called Insight Out by Billy Samoa, mm. on that podcast, after the podcast, and then when I spoke to Marsha, I was saying that's how I discovered her. And then she was like, yeah, that guy's really done his research. And, you know, he, he and I'm like, you know, I don't normally do too much research. It's usually organic and I get to know my people on the show. But now I know why he did research. You can't get off that website. You want to go into the next, then the next story and the next story. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so no wonder. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, is there anything else you'd like to share uh, with my audience? Any other message before we wind up? I think just going back to storytelling, just the message that it really anybody who wants to be a good storyteller can be. I've been doing this work for eight years and I have never had a single person who wants to do it that I haven't been able to send away as a better storyteller. And in my experience, it just makes life so much nicer. It makes it easier to explain things. It makes it easier to get to know people. It makes it easier to want to work with people. Even, you know, for all the positivity we've talked about, I am British and so I have this cynical edge and, <laughs> and and especially when I'm nervous and when I go to an event and I don't know anybody my over if I'm on the stage I'm fine but if I'm in the audience my overwhelming response is that I hate everybody and I think it's because I feel like oh maybe you are perfect and you'll judge me because I'm not and I found the way to stop doing that is to get people to tell you stories and then ask them and how did you feel and how did you feel and what they will invariably say is like that was scary or I felt stupid or something that shows they're not a perfect robot and that's the way to stop hating <laughs> and so I really mm. feel like stories are the keys to the key to everything and everyone can do it and don't be afraid to practice because people who are good at telling stories practice all the time they, they, they just do it in their head they don't realize they're doing it and, um, <laughs> and so anyone can do it and I think that it makes life so much better and also listen to more of Susmita's podcast because you're wonderful <laughs> Aww, thank you <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining and, you know, that one link, all your other links and link to your newsletter, the website, everything's going to be in there, right? So people can just go there and find you and connect with you there. Yes, yes it'll all be there. And a video where I dress up and I reenact the Rocky theme tune. I mean, the Rocky, yeah, the Rocky <laughs> training montage, so you can watch. Here's a, here's a secret tip. When in that video... There's somebody punching me in the stomach because that's what happens in the Rocky training montage. I mean, just pretending to, but it's my mum. That's the thing I don't say in the video. My mum is ah, pretending. Ah, okay. <laughs> nice. She just happened to be saying and I needed somebody to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so speaking, oh, this has been so fun. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight. Same here, Masha. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> wasn't that so much fun it's such a fun episode Marsha has a lovely energy and I could just keep chatting with her forever and I know that you know 
when you all check out her website and watch her videos, you're all going to be totally, totally blown away by Marsha's energy and her magic. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, then take a screenshot of the episode and uh, tag me at Veganosaurus and Marsha at Yes Yes Marsha on Instagram and uh, share your biggest takeaways with us. That would be lovely. You know, it'll also help the show get discovered by more people so that this kind of energy touches more lives. And of course, I'd always appreciate a rate, review or subscribe on your favorite podcast app, especially iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Feel Good Factor. I'm Susmita Veganosaurus and I'm looking forward to talking to you again very soon. Bye!